Hello, I'm Dan Schillinger, and this is the week three lecture on Thucydides for historical and political thought and directed studies. Here's what's coming. The lecture will unfold in six parts. First, I'll introduce Thucydides, then we'll turn to Pericles and the plague, third, the Mytilenean debate, fourth, Corsairian civil war, fifth, the Melian dialogue, and finally, by way of conclusion, the Sicilian expedition. Well, I recommend that you watch the lecture straight through. I've marked where each of these segments begins um, in the description of the video. Maybe when you're reviewing this material later on, you'll want to skip around. Should you have questions about the lecture, please don't hesitate to contact me, even if you're not in my section. Always a pleasure to talk Thucydides. Okay, I hope you find this helpful and enjoyable. Thanks so much, everyone. Thucydides is one of my favorite thinkers. I'm thrilled to talk to you about him. Yet he isn't exactly a pleasant read. Thucydides himself worries at the outset of the history in Book 1, Section 22, page 48 of our edition, that his history, quote, will seem less easy to read because of the absence in it of a romantic element, something pleasing, something musical. What exactly might the reader find unpleasant or difficult to take about the history? Well, look at the very next passage on the same page in which Thucydides highlights the unprecedented suffering, as he puts it, caused by the war. In his own words, never had so many cities been captured and then devastated, never had there been so many exiles, never such loss of life, both in the actual warfare and in internal revolutions. Think of the Athenians suffering under the plague, the Corsairians massacring one another down to the last man in their civil war, the Athenians executing the Melians, enslaving the women and children of Melos, and then the destruction of the Athenian expedition to Sicily in turn. Thucydides distinguishes himself by attending to these dismal events. By contrast, for many political thinkers that we will read in this course, the primary task of political philosophy is to imagine, if not to bring about, the best regime or the good society. Not political collapse during war, but the just city flourishing during peace might seem to be the highest and proper theme of political thought. Maybe that's true. Plato, Aristotle, Augustine, Locke, Rousseau, Hegel, all these guys seem to think it's true, and that's a murderer's row of political philosophers. But Thucydides can call in his own reinforcements. We will read multiple anti-utopian thinkers in this course, thinkers who self-consciously refuse to take their bearings from imaginations or professions of the political best, and who instead focus on the operation of efficacious power. Among these are Machiavelli, Hobbes, and Nietzsche, themselves readers and admirers of Thucydides. According to Nietzsche, for example, Thucydides is the original political realist, the first political thinker to theorize power by itself, untainted by the delusional hopes for justice that you find, uh, Nietzsche would say, in Platonic and Christian political thought in particular. According to Nietzsche, if you feel the pull of utopian political longings within yourself, then you need a certain bitter medicine. That is, you need to read Thucydides' history. I'd suggest that Thucydides is, in fact, a more thoroughgoing realist than Nietzsche, a more thoroughgoing realist than Machiavelli and Hobbes as well, since he, unlike them, does not write in order to remake the political world. So why is Thucydides' history such a cold shower of a book? For Thucydides, in my view, as I understand him, the cultivation of judgment requires accurate understanding of the whole of political life, including its dark side. Rather than trade pleasing stories for approval or influence in the manner of a poet such as Homer, a demagogue such as the Athenian leader Cleon, or even a fabulous historian such as Herodotus, Thucydides proclaims that he will instead write a war narrative that is both accurate and useful, and as a result, 
an enduring possession, something that will last forever, that will be useful far into the future. A former Athenian statesman himself, exiled in 424 for failing to prevent the revolt of an Athenian tributary ally, a subject of the empire, a city called Amphipolis in northern Greece, Thucydides offers would-be political leaders among his readers an unvarnished account of political life that lingers on the level of brute facts and refuses to cover over complexity or unpleasantness. In fact, Thucydides devotes himself to precisely those atrocities and calamities. He describes and analyzes those atrocities and calamities that appear to be as horrific and as fatal as they are difficult to explain in full. For example, and to mention them once more, the plague at Athens and Corsairean civil war, those are the episodes that elicit um, the longest passages of authorial commentary in the work. In sum, to finish up this intro, Thucydides eschews moralism and systematicity because he teaches a kind of judgment that is attuned in a quasi-tragic mode to the errors and disasters that shape political life. Let's look more closely at the text and let me anticipate a potential objection. The most well-known passage in Thucydides' history, the speech of Thucydides' Pericles, his funeral oration delivered in commemoration of the first Athenians to die in the war with the Peloponnesians, this speech might seem to be anti-tragic, even utopian. In fact, this speech isn't just the most well-known passage in the work, it's the most famous speech to have survived from classical antiquity. You can hear echoes of it in Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, and it has informed philosophical defenses of political action um, in the 20th century, for example, by Hannah Arendt. In fact, that's a decent way to approach the speech as a beautiful defense of political action and of democratic citizenship in particular. More precisely, the funeral oration does not resemble a eulogy, as, as you might have thought, it's a funeral oration, um, or an apology, a defense speech, so much as it resembles a piece of epideictic rhetoric, a praise speech, um, and the object of Pericles' praise is the Athenian democratic regime. Now, what kind of regime is Athens? Well, it's a democracy, that's obvious, but it's not a constitutional or liberal democracy like the United States and many other um, democratic states around the world today. What's the difference? The Athenian democracy was not representative, but direct. Today, in our representative or electoral democracy, the governing happens in a faraway place called Washington, and I find out about it on the news, um, even though I am a citizen and uh, you know, enter a voting booth every once in a while. By contrast, in Athens, full political power resided in the Athenian people themselves when they gathered together on a hill called the Panix in Athens in their deliberative capacity. Um, they could decide to do pretty much whatever they wanted. In certain ways, in fact, Athens was so much more democratic um, than contemporary democracies. Anyone could speak in the assembly. Most offices were filled by sortition, that is by lot. People were chosen at random to be office holders. The people also thought on behalf of the city and as jurors in the law courts, they held elites accountable. This was democracy in the original sense of the world, democratia, people power. Of course, there's a lot to criticize about democratic Athens, don't get me wrong, I'm not pining for it. Not least its imperialism, its slave labor, its exclusion of women from political life, its recurrent factional conflicts, its lack um, of a notion of rights, never mind a bill of rights. Indeed, as I'll soon argue, Thucydides himself is a critic of Periclean Athens, even though he wants to make a strong case on its behalf. Pericles begins his account of the Athenian democracy in the funeral oration um, at section 37 of book two, page 145 of our text. According to Pericles, democracy means rule of the people for the people. 
In Athens, all citizens are equal before the law. The outcomes of lawsuits do not depend on social status or wealth. Um, when the Athenians elect someone to office, moreover, there were a few offices that were elected, like the generalship, that makes sense, right? You need a certain expertise to be general. When the Athenians do elect someone to office, they forget about wealth, according to Pericles, and think only of the citizen's virtue. Pericles also emphasizes the idea of freedom, freedom to participate in public life and to pursue pleasure in private life. This freedom, he says, is compatible with lawfulness for all their liberality. The Athenians are orderly. They fear and revere and obey the law. In sum, Athens squares the political circle by incorporating into the democracy virtues and practices that might seem to be at odds with one another. Equality and meritocracy, reverence for the law and freedom to pursue um, whatever you want to do in private, um, the activities of speech and those of action, deliberation and martial excellence. How exactly does participation in this rich civic life, the life of the Athenian democracy, benefit the individual Athenian? On the bottom of the same page, 147, beginning of section 41, Pericles says, quote, taking everything together then, I declare that our city is an education to Greece, very famous line, and I declare that in my opinion, each single one of our citizens in all the manifold aspects of life is able to show himself the rightful lord and owner of his own person. It's not quite how I'd translate that. He's able to show himself, uh, he's able to show that he's self-sufficient. Um, and, and he does this moreover with exceptional grace and great versatility. The point is that Athenian democratic politics educates its citizens to virtue. Politics is for the sake of ethics, for the sake of cultivating our distinctly human capacities. What virtue in particular does Athens cultivate, or what virtues rather? Um, look back a little bit, section 40 on the same page, up the page. Um, the answer seems to be deliberative rationality um, and courage. Those are the two virtues um, distinctive to the Athenians. The Athenians learn how to deliberate in the assembly, right, by thinking through all of the questions of, of political life, um, you know, questions about law and war and peace and so forth. Um, and they cultivate their courage when they put their plans um, into effect. On the one hand, we can say that this isn't a mere boast. Think back to the speeches at Sparta delivered in book one, the Corinthians, um, presented that amazing depiction of the Athenian character. The Athenians are a whirlwind um, of thinking um, and activity, and it's exactly that mixture um, of thought and action that provides the city with its um, unique um, kinetic energy. On the other hand, the funeral oration might give you pause, too. Let me point out three problematic moments in the speech that I think Thucydides wants us to notice. First, while the Athenian envoys to Sparta in book one had um, offered a defensive account of the growth of the Athenian empire, right? An account that um, at least claimed that the Athenians had to grow the empire out of fear, out of necessity. Pericles takes a very different tack. He says that the empire is a freely chosen project, and he even uses the euphemism of friendship to describe the Athenians' conquest and imperial rule of their subject cities. Um, again, page 147, section 40, beginning of the second paragraph, quote, we make friends by doing good to others, not by receiving good from them. I really doubt that is how uh, the Athenian subject cities um, think of Athens as a, as a good friend benefiting them at every turn. Um, I, I really doubt it, and we'll see that's not the case as we go on. Second, when Pericles commands his audience, um, moreover, in section 43, page 149, middle of the page, so we're moving forward in the speech now. Um, again, section 143, page 149, uh, middle of the page, Pericles commands his audience to, quote, Fix your eyes every day on the greatness of Athens as she really is, and fall in love with her. 
That's a strange line. Um, and it's strange in the Greek. Pericles uses a cognate of the Greek word for sexual love, eros. Um, that, oh, this is strange though, right? Is it really appropriate that citizens direct their sexual longing toward politics, toward the city and toward empire in particular? Um, that, that seems potentially problematic. Third, finally, Pericles asserts that death and battle on behalf of Athens is so glorious that it is, quote, unperceived or unfelt. That's the word he uses near the top of page 150. Their deaths are unperceived. Really, when you uh, catch an arrow through the helmet as an Athenian hoplite, you don't even feel it, you don't perceive it. In the next line, in a similar vein, Pericles refuses to offer sympathy to the parents of the dead. Um, you know, he tells them, um, no, no commiseration, no sympathy, just be of, of good cheer. Um, your, your kids have died this glorious death. There's really no reason for you to grieve. So these discord, discordant remarks on death and grief, um, I, I think are problematic and they're accentuated by um, the end of the speech where Pericles commands the women of Athens um, to be silent and absent, to stop lamenting. What these remarks add up to, in my view, is a radical depreciation of the body and of private life. Is such a depreciation um, a bad thing? Well, the record scratch moment that follows Pericles' funeral oration, the sudden onset of the plague at Athens suggests, yes, this, this is potentially a bad thing. <laughs> by placing Pericles' funeral oration and his account of the plague side by side without any intervening material, Thucydides invites us to juxtapose the two passages. The contrast is stark. Athens as cosmopolis in the funeral oration yields to Athens as necropolis in Thucydides' account of the plague. To the putatively unfelt deaths of Athenian soldiers, Thucydides juxtaposes his own grisly depiction of the plague's effects on the body, namely his body, because he had the plague. Bloodshot eyes, sore throat, fetid breath, sneezing, hoarseness, shortness of breath, coughing, retching, blisters and sores, insomnia, diarrhea, and in the worst cases, the loss of extremities, including fingers, toes, and genitals. To Pericles' refusal to issue condolences, Thucydides juxtaposes the Athenian air, thick with lamentation and with the smoke of funeral pyres. Bodily decay and lamentation during the plague give the lie to Pericles' depreciation of the private and his corresponding inflation of the political, whereas formerly the Athenians might have hoped to die gloriously in pitched battle for the democracy that had taught them to flourish as citizens. During the plague, they died like flies in isolation from one another, tending to their disintegrating bodies. With their civic self with their civic self-image shaken or shattered, how did the Athenians understand what was happening to them? Thucydides' remarks at um, 154, section one, sorry, at 254, section 54 of book two, page 156, top of the page, that quote, at this time of distress, people naturally recalled an old oracle. War with the Dorians comes and a death will come at the same time. Yet Thucydides notes that there was disagreement about the correct wording of this oracle. Did the oracle mention death or was it dearth? In the Greek, did it mention plague, uh, loimos, or was it famine, limos? Um, Thucydides says that in the present circumstances, of course, the Athenians went with death, plague, because that's what was happening to them. Should another Dorian war come, another war with the Spartans where there's a famine, Thucydides says, well, then they'll go with the dearth reading. So, so much for uh, the divinity of oracles. Um, Thucydides' point here, right, is not that the oracle is divine. It's that the Athenians are divinizing and moralizing their own suffering rather than leaving it ambiguous and unauthored. Equally important on this point are Thucydides' reflections on the psychological reactions manifested by individual Athenians who contracted the disease. Turn to section 
51, um, page 154. The most terrible thing of all, quoting Thucydides here, was the despair into which people fell when they realized that they had caught the plague, for they would immediately adopt an attitude of utter hopelessness, and by giving in this way, would lose their powers of resistance. Conversely, toward the end of the same paragraph, Thucydides reports that because no one got the plague twice, the survivors, quote, were congratulated on all sides and they themselves were so elated at the time of their recovery that they fondly imagined that they could never die of any other disease in the future. For Thucydides, the fatalism of the first cough and the optimism of the broken fever are of a piece. The Athenians want their suffering to be meaningful, lamentable, just. By exposing this longing in the context of his depiction of the bodily, religious, and political disorder brought about by the plague, Thucydides declines to satisfy it. Rather, anticipating Susan Sontag, Thucydides warns against the moralization of illness, a delusion with dangerous consequences. We see those consequences in the Athenians' punitive anger at Pericles, whom, unlike the gods, they can blame for what is happening to them. And maybe they have some grounds to blame him because, as you'll remember, Thucydides' war plan required bringing in from the Attic countryside, right, all these people who usually lived outside the city walls. So they're all crowded within the city when the plague breaks out, and you can imagine how it swept through them. In his final speech um, to the Athenian assembly, uh, section 60 through 64 of book two, Pericles confronts his fellow citizens and, and their anger, the anger that they feel um, toward him and his war plan. Here, Pericles acts as both football coach and therapist. On the one hand, he takes the people to task for doing exactly what he knew they would do, that is change their minds as they experience the personal losses that attend upon war. He had predicted that change of heart in the very first words of his first speech in the history. The end of book one, you can go back and look at it. On the other hand, he also builds the people up, soothing their fear and stoking their hope. He reminds them that their naval power is not yet threatened and that this power is so great, they should think of their empire as practically limitless. And again, as he did in the funeral oration, he predicts, um, and in his first speech, his war speech, he promises them glory and, um, sorry, he promises them victory um, and, and predicts that it will be glorious. At this point in the text, um, 265, page 163, there's yet another record scratch moment. Thucydides launches into a eulogy of Pericles. What, you might have said to yourself, a eulogy of Pericles? Did I miss something? Did Pericles die? Um, yes, he did die. Um, the plague respects no one. Now, in his so-called eulogy of Pericles, um, Thucydides makes clear that he admires Pericles' statesmanlike foresight and his capacity, his rhetorical capacity, to manage through speech the emotions of the Athenian people. At the same time, it's possible to exaggerate Thucydides' praise of Pericles. Notice, first of all, that Thucydides praises other leaders in the work. I mentioned this during the round table. If you look back at 138, um, the 30, uh, 138th section of book one, you'll see that Thucydides praises Themistocles to the skies. Um, um, he um, seems to hold Themistocles in higher regard than he does Pericles. Even more importantly, Thucydides says that under Pericles, the Athenian democracy wasn't a democracy at all. It was a hidden monarchy, the rule of Pericles masquerading as the rule of the Athenian people. While you might think that Thucydides prefers this crypto monarchy to the Athenian democracy, he goes on to say that after Pericles, um, subsequent leaders, lesser leaders, demagogues and would-be tyrants like Cleon and Alcibiades followed Pericles in arrogating power to themselves, and that 
um, was bad for Athens. Zooming out from this section of the text and to conclude this part of the lecture, Thucydides' history viewed as a whole chips away at the Periclean vision of Athens that we get in the funeral oration if it does not destroy that vision entirely. When the Athenians died during the war, their deaths were often inglorious and they were certainly felt. They experienced terrible bodily suffering. More importantly, the city for which they died was less worthy of their devotion than Pericles had thought. The democracy fell prey to demagogues and it dominated and massacred the subjects of the empire. Note then that Thucydides doesn't disregard utopian political thinking. Um, I said at the beginning of the lecture that Thucydides is an anti-utopian thinker, but he's an anti-utopian thinker whose text performs a critique of the utopian vision of Pericles. In our next section, the so-called Mytilenean debate, we see Athens' seamy underbelly even more clearly. In the summer of 428, the city of Mytilene, the largest on the island of Lesbos, revolted from the Athenian Empire. The revolt of the Mytileneans infuriated the Athenians because Mytilene had served Athens under favorable terms. What's more, the city had called in for assistance in the rebellion Athens' hated enemy, the Spartans. Immediately after the revolt, the Athenians besieged the city. With their food running out and with the Spartans late to help, as usual, the Mytilenean people betrayed the city to, to the Athenians. Evidently, it was certain elites, not the whole population, not the people who had conspired against Athens. The furious Athenians drew no distinctions, however, deciding to execute the entire adult male population and to enslave the women and children. But when the Athenians wake the next day with a massive moral hangover, to borrow an awesome quip from one of my old teachers, they move to reconsider the question of Mytilene's punishment. As Thucydides writes at Book 3, Section 35, page 212 of our edition, quote, there was a sudden change of feeling and people began to think how cruel and how unprecedented such a decision was to destroy not only the guilty, but the entire population of the state. Enter Cleon and Diodotus, two Athenian leaders, who will debate the issue in the Athenian citizen assembly, Cleon arguing for the original sentence and Diodotus against it for leniency. Dramatic, disturbing, and philosophically rich, their speeches comprise a peak of the work. Cleon speaks first. Thucydides tells us, at 336, bottom of page 212, that he had been responsible for passing the original motion of execution and that he, Cleon, possessed a violent or angry character and that he, moreover, was the most influential man in Athens at the time. So who is Cleon? How would we describe him? A populist demagogue. He inflames the emotions of the people, stokes their suspicions of elites, Yet there's little evidence that he really pursues their good as opposed to his own. Notice how Cleon berates the people on the bottom of page 214, section 37, for being infatuated with the speeches of Athenian elites and for conflating the assembly with the theater. All the while, he himself, an elite if there ever was one, is giving an extremely ornate speech that relies on bombastic rhetoric and the denunciation of elites. This is red meat for his base, as we might now say. Um, it's also all very underhanded. At the same time, Cleon does have an argument to make. Top of page 214, quote, after a lapse of time, the injured party will lose the edge of his anger when he comes to act against those who have wronged him, whereas the best punishment and the one most fitted to the crime is when reprisals follow immediately. What is Cleon saying here? Well, he's telling you to do exactly what you shouldn't do when you receive that annoying text from your friend. Don't pause, just get angry. <laughs> well, why? Why would Cleon make that argument? Assured that Athens is in the right, that Mytilene's revolt was premeditated and unjust, Cleon supposes that maximum anger 
will fuel a proportionately retributive response. Having made this argument from justice, Cleon goes on in the second half of the speech to make one from interest. At 339, page 216, Cleon contends that every Athenian ally will, quote, revolt upon the slightest pretext when success means freedom and failure brings no very dreadful consequences. In other words, to deter future revolts, the Athenians need to execute the, the Mytilenians, whatever justice may require. Thus, Cleon concludes in section 40, top of page 217, quote, if you follow my advice, you will be doing the right thing as far as Mytilene is concerned, the just thing, and at the same time, you will be acting in your own interest, in your own advantage. Justice and interest together recommend uh, the execution of the Mytilenean people, according to Cleon. Now for Diodotus, whose name means gift of the god and whose existence is unattested outside the pages of Thucydides. Could he be Thucydides' invention? At least his speech responds brilliantly to Cleon's by out-Cleoning Cleon. For whereas Cleon had presented himself as an extremely hard-boiled imperialist ready to do whatever it takes um, to strengthen the Athenian empire, Diodotus goes one step further. Page 219, section 44, quote, I might prove that they are the most guilty people in the world, Diodotus says, but it does not follow that I shall propose the death penalty unless that is in your interest. Look also at page 221, section 46, near the bottom of the page, here Diodotus says something similar, quote, our business therefore is not to injure ourselves by looking like a judge who strictly examines a criminal. Instead, we should be looking for a method by which, employing moderation in our punishments, we can in future secure for ourselves the full use of those cities which bring us important contributions. Do you see how brilliant this is? According to Diodotus, Cleon's speech um, was not realistic, but moralistic, insofar as Cleon supposed that justice matters at all in these circumstances. But why shouldn't justice matter? On a practical level, Diodotus contends in section 46 that if the Athenians punish rebels with execution, then every city having rebelled will hold out to the last because it doesn't matter. Um, given now, given later, we're just going to die. In a more theoretical register, though, he also suggests that punishment just doesn't work as a deterrent. The key lines occur on page 220, section 45, toward the bottom of the page. Um, look, look at these lines carefully. Quote, hope and desire persist throughout and cause the greatest calamities, one leading and the other following one conceiving the enterprise and the other suggesting that it will be successful, invisible factors, but more powerful than the terrors that are obvious to our eyes. Cleon's mistake is to suppose that human beings will not err so long as they know punishment will follow. On Diodotus's view, um, the most powerful forces in human life are exactly those invisible ones, hope, desire, the emotions. Um, the um, strongest forces within the human soul. And these often overwhelm judgment. Error is ubiquitous, and the ubiquity of error justifies a lenient response to it. That's a key point. Whatever Diodotus may say, the concern for justice, this concern with justification, is not in fact absent from his speech. Did you catch, in fact, where he you know, pretty explicitly smuggles in um, 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 the idea of justice, his attachment to justice, even though he tells us that all this stuff will be absent from his speech? Section 47, page 222, quote, but if you destroy the Democratic Party at Mytilene, who never took any hand in the revolt, and who, as soon as they got arms, voluntarily gave the city up to you, you will first of all be guilty of killing those who have helped you. 
killing the innocent along with the guilty is unjust. That's the premise of that statement. Now, why doesn't Diodotus say as much, clearly and directly? Why had he claimed not to care about justice? Early in the speech, in response to Cleon's claim that, the or that orators in Athens are frequently bribed, Diodotus says on page 219, section 43, near the top of the page, quote, and because of this refinement in intellectuality, the state is put into a unique position. It is only she, Athens, to whom no one can ever do a good turn openly and without deception. So suspicious are the Athenians of just men, so eager are they to think of themselves as hard-boiled war hawks, that Diodotus is compelled to speak their love language, the language of interest, the language of power, of advantage, not of justice. With this point in mind, and approaching the conclusion of this section of the lecture, let's look at the result of the debate. The votes are nearly equal. Diodotus's position barely wins. Yet when the Athenians agreed to reconsider the question of the punishment of the Mytilenians earlier that day, it had seemed that most people were uncomfortable with the initial decision. Does that mean that Cleon's speech, in fact, was more successful, that it persuaded a greater number of people than Diodotus's, persuaded them to revert back to um, the decision to execute? Observe also what the Athenians ultimately decide to do to save the Mytilenean people, but still to execute a full 1,000 Mytilenean oligarchs. For all that this episode puts on display the humane statesmanship of Diodotus, for all that it urges us to sympathize with feckless hum human beings who err again and again, perhaps especially in their pursuit of freedom, freedom from empire, it also suggests the beginning of the end for Athens. Athens' demagoguery, its lack of freedom of speech, its self-serving rhetoric of power, its willingness to kill, none of these things bode well. We arrive now at the longest piece of authorial commentary in the work, longer even than Thucydides' remarks on the plague at Athens. In 427 BC, the city-state of Corsaira, modern-day Corfu, degenerated into civil war. Thucydides depicts the extreme violence committed by the factionaries, the democratic and oligarchic Corsairians. As Thucydides puts it in Book 3, Section 81, page 241, at Corsaira, quote, there was death in every shape and form. Fathers killed sons, men were dragged from temples or killed within them. Neither the attachments of family nor those of piety protected the Corsairians from death at the hands of their enemies. One might think that Thucydides uses this episode to show the importance of law and order. In its absence, human beings succumb to their own worst impulses, as Thucydides' great English translator, Thomas Hobbes, would argue in his own masterwork, Leviathan, which we'll read in the spring. But could the absence of law and order really explain why fathers killed their own sons? On the contrary, for Thucydides, civil war is not defined by an absence of politics, but by an excess of it. Fathers killed their sons in Corsaira because, in Thucydides' own words, near the top of page 243, quote, family relations were a weaker tie than party membership, since party members were more ready to go to any extreme for any reason whatever. Loyalty to party, to faction, more precisely, and hatred of the enemy swallowed all other human attachments and conventions. Whereas for Hobbes, civil war refers to the utter absence or breakdown of political order, for Thucydides, factional conflict refers to the perverse totalization of political life, politics squared, if you will. So all-consuming was civil war at Corsaira that it fundamentally altered the way the Corsairians communicated with one another and understood themselves. Most famously, according to Thucydides, 
Corsairian civil war corrupted the very language of the virtues. Corsairians came to esteem reckless violence and to disdain courage. What was formerly praised as self-control appeared in the context of the civil war to indicate an absence of partisan zeal. Perversely, the most extreme individuals were praised for their tight control over their characters. Note that on my reading, though scholars argue about this, it is not the meanings of the words themselves that changed during Corsairian civil war, but rather the Corsairians' estimation or evaluation of them. Anyway, the point is that democratic and oligarchic Corsairians were more like opposing armies than fellow citizens, and this had a profound effect on their characters. It changed them. As Thucydides writes um, in section 83, at least in the original Greek, um, their very thoughts were arrayed for battle. It's a beautiful line. Haunting, too. Like tragic heroes, then, the participants in factional conflict commit heinous crimes, not because they're fundamentally evil people, but because their circumstances, like those of Oedipus, push them to err. War is a stern teacher, in Thucydides' phrase, a teacher of violence by violence. Rather than blame the factionaries for destroying Corsaira, Thucydides taps the circumstances of the war, including the larger circumstance of the war between Athens and Sparta that is at this time presently engulfing Greece. Um, it's this larger circumstance, in addition to the, the more immediate one of civil war at Corsaira, that infects these people with the desire and the ability to murder their neighbors. Now for the Melian Dialogue, the most notorious passage in Thucydides' history, but maybe also the most misunderstood. What's distinctive about the Melian Dialogue as compared to every other passage in the work? Well, maybe obviously, it's a dialogue, a dramatic confrontation and direct speech between the Athenian envoys to Melos and the leaders of the Melians. More emphatically, it's a great dialogue, a dialogue that maybe rivals Plato's dialogues. And like any dialogue on that level, you have to um, attend to every step of the argument. It demands a blow-by-blow -blow account. And having used that boxing metaphor, I'm going to extend it um, by giving you a kind of rough narration of this conflict, um, of the drama of the dialogue, maybe a bit like a a boxing announcer. We'll call round one sections 85 through 88. What's at issue in this first round of the dialogue? What's at issue is the dialogue itself, how they're going to conduct it. The Melians cry foul because the Athenians propose to have this leisurely conversation, say over lunch with some wine, while they have a massive naval force parked in the Melians harbor. In effect, the Melians say, we can't do diplomacy in any sort of honest way when you are threatening to annihilate us. To which the Athenians respond, no, that very threat of annihilation is the thing that we have to talk about. Score round one, who wins? Um, well, the Athenians win um, on the level of um, what happens of practice, insofar as the Melians acquiesce, they say, yes, we can have a conversation under these conditions. Um, and I think it makes sense that the Athenians win. They're right. Did the Melians really think that the Athenians would go home so that fair negotiations could begin in earnest? While speech may be the medium of political life, speech is always hemmed in by material realities, not least the realities of power. Round two, sections 89 through 91. First of all, in section 89, top of page 402, we find the most famous line in Thucydides, a line beloved by political realists and frequently trotted out by IR courses. The Athenians say, quote, the standard of justice depends on the equality of power to compel, and that in fact, the strong do what they have the power to do, and the weak accept what they have to accept. What the Athenians are in fact saying here is not, as many scholars have supposed, that might makes right, but rather that the domain of justice is limited. Appeals to justice only work 
um, when the dispute is between two equals in power, otherwise the power disparity by itself is determinative. This view still relies on a big assumption, namely um, that no one regards justice as the highest good, something for which they would sacrifice everything, even though they are you know, clearly weaker um, than their enemy. How do the millions reply in section 90? Well, they say even the powerful should have an interest in allowing appeals to justice because the powerful will one day become weak and they too will want to be able to appeal to justice. To which the Athenians say in section 91, so kind of you to look out for us little millions, but it's not like we've never thought about the fact that our empire is going to end um, it's going strong right now, and we are here trying to extend it. So let us worry about the end of our empire and right now have the conversation on our terms. Let's talk about your survival. Our interests coincide in precisely this way, right? We get to rule you, you get to survive. Score round two, um, again, the Athenians win. Look, when a person mugs you at gunpoint and asks you to give up your wallet, you yielded gladly, no? That's a rough way of putting it, but affairs among cities, among nations, tend to be pretty rough. And the Athenians aren't really asking for much. They're just asking that the Melians enter into a tributary alliance, that they provide money and manpower to Athens, otherwise the Melians' lives wouldn't much change. Round three stretches from 92 to 99, sections 92 to 99 of book five again, um, the Melians forced the Athenians to explain to them over and over how becoming part of the Athenian Empire really serves the interests of either Athens or Melos. Um, who wins round three? Again, it's the Athenians in a rout. Don't you get it, Melians? They're saying this is an offer you can't refuse. You get to survive. Round four, sections 100 to 105. This is where it gets good. Having listened to the Athenians dispassionately lecture them on how beneficial it would be for them, the Melians, to become an island subject to Athens, and how necessary it is for the Athenians to conquer every last island, the Melians are disgusted, and they return to their original attachment to justice, um, to the language of virtue. At 102, the Melians double down. They announce, Look, we won't abandon hope. They make clear that they're preparing to resist. Hope, at this point, the Athenians are screaming. What's the basis of these hopes? Are you really going to risk the survival of your city on hopes and prayers? That's exactly what we're going to do, say the Melians in 104, because the gods reward justice and punish injustice. By praying to the gods and by appealing to the Spartans, we will save ourselves. Here the dialogue reaches its theoretical peak. Against the Melians' view of a moral order supported by just gods, the Athenians offer their own theology. No less than human beings, they say, the gods rule to the limits of their power. Nature compels all, both gods and human beings, to seek power after power. The Athenians deny that there is any support for justice in nature. Rather, in extending the empire as far as possible, they are achieving um, the true form of excellence that is natural, um, the excellence of a conqueror. With regard to the possibility of a Spartan alliance, finally, the Athenians say, good luck, Melians. The Spartans are slow, scared, and self-interested. They're not going to save you. So the dialogue has failed as a dialogue. In fact, it soon peters out, and the Athenians cut it off altogether in section 111. The decisions of the Melians and the Athenians in sections 112 and 113, the Melians to fight, confirm that the representatives of each city emerge from the dialogue all the more entrenched in the positions with, with, with which they began it. But who is to blame for the result? We scored rounds one to three for the Athenians. If we've just witnessed a climactic final round, round four, who wins at least on the level of the argument? 
On the one hand, the pathetic conclusion to the whole episode vindicates the Athenians. The Melians are utterly destroyed. Their hopes proved frivolous, just as the Athenians had said. Neither the gods nor the Spartans saved Melos. But can we really say that the Athenians have won? Whereas they had hoped to use the Melians' money and manpower for the sake of the empire, instead they had to expend money and manpower to destroy Melos, a tiny island city of no strategic significance. Worse yet, having insisted on a dialogue, the Athenians did not conduct it very well. How should they have approached the Melians? How would Diodotus have conducted this conversation? For all the avowed realism of the Athenian ambassadors to Melos, for all that they insist that they don't care about justice, that they're, living the, that they're limiting the conversation to considerations of power, don't they ultimately seem rather Cleonian or even Stenolidian? They want to teach the Melians a lesson. They're offended by the Melians' stupidity. In Diodotus's view, though, thoroughgoing realism means grasping how unrealistic, how incurably hopeful human beings can be. Diodotus would not have begrudged the Melians their attachment to the very goods, freedom, and self-rule that the Athenians themselves cherish. In fact, the Melians may have reminded him and they may remind you of the Athenians themselves when they stood up to the Persians at Salamis, but that means that the Athenians have become the Persians. In this short final segment of the lecture, I want to say a few words about the movement, the transition from the Melian dialogue at the end of book five to the Sicilian expedition and its disastrous result in book six and seven. In the first, the Athenians utterly destroy the Melians, enslaving the women and children. At Syracuse, by contrast, the Athenian armament is itself utterly destroyed. Look at the final lines of book seven, page 537 of our edition. They were utterly and entirely defeated, Thucydides says, of the Athenian fleet. Their sufferings were on an enormous scale. Their losses were, as they say, total. Army, navy, everything was destroyed, and out of many, only few returned. The Athenians get their comeuppance, their punishment, you might be tempted to say, for having crushed the Melians. And yet, that would probably be too strong. I'm not sure that there's a lesson about justice here. Why? because the expedition could have succeeded. Return to Thucydides' eulogy of Pericles, book two, section 65, page 164, where Thucydides makes clear that it was the Athenians' private quarrels about popular leadership that brought the expedition down. Let me highlight another evocative link between the Melian dialogue and the Sicilian expedition by asking you this question. Why did the Athenians go to Sicily in the first place? Didn't they have enough on their plate, um, a war with the Peloponnesians? Turn to book six, section 24, page 425. Thucydides says in his own name, there was a passion for the enterprise which affected everyone alike. The young had a longing for the sights and experiences of distant places and were confident that they would return safely. And the general masses and the average soldier saw the prospect of permanent paid employment. A witch's brew of erotic longing. Thucydides uses that language just as Pericles had used it. Um, erotic longing, naive hope, and greed drives the Athenians to Syracuse. They are more like the Melians than they had realized. Placing their hopes for safety in the unseen future sounds pretty Melian. And their era, stoked by Pericles, is less noble than it had seemed, since it can be reduced in this passage to a desire for sightseeing and money. In short, Thucydides is a critic of Athenian imperialism. I didn't mean to suggest that he wasn't when I said that um, the Athenians um, are not exactly being punished in Syracuse. Um, but he's a critic of Athenian imperialism because it's so misguided 
um, because it's so grubby, because it aims at um, money um, and domination, um, and it's not um, well executed in any case. I want to highlight one last connection between the Melian Dialogue, the Sicilian Expedition, and Pericles. The name of that connection is Alcibiades, um, the last great Athenian statesman that we meet in the work. Look at book six, and, uh, and I should say that he's not, <laughs> I, that's not, I shouldn't offer an unqualified description of him as an Athenian statesman. He's, he's a pretty ambiguous dude, as we're about to see. Look at book six, section 16, page 419, Alcibiades' first words in the history. Quote, Though it is quite natural for my fellow citizens to envy me for the magnificence with which I have done things in Athens, such as providing choruses and so on, yet to the outside world this also is evidence of our strength. And it is perfectly fair for a man who has a high opinion of himself not to be put on a level with everyone else. Certainly when one is badly off, one does not find people coming to share in one's misfortunes. And just as no one takes much notice of us if we are failures, so on the same principle, one has to put up with it if one is looked down upon by the successful. What is Alcibiades arguing in this passage and where have we heard it before? That just as mighty Athens crushes tiny Milos, no matter the objections of the Melians, so mighty Alcibiades crushes his rivals within Athens, and everyone should understand that he is to be admired for so doing. Alcibiades has introduced into the city of Athens the logic of conquest among cities expounded by the Athenian envoys to Melos. A few lines later, at the bottom of page 419, Alcibiades predicts that while he may be unpopular while he is alive, while people may envy him, after his death, they will all claim that they are related to him. Do you get the joke here? Uh, oh, um, grandpa? Um, no, he's, he's not actually my grandpa. My, my grandma slept with Alcibiades. Um, it's meant to be funny, and it kind of is, but it's also sad. Um, because Alcibiades' antagonism of his fellow citizens falls so far short um, of the public spiritedness promised of Athenians by Pericles. From Pericles to Alcibiades, from the democratic statesman to the would-be despot, Thucydides' history traces the descent of Athens, a descent made concrete when the Athenians died down in the quarries of Syracuse. Thucydides traces this descent while holding out little hope for a subsequent ascent. To do the work of ascent, of thinking about justice and political form, political reform, will need the guidance of Plato. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening. <laughs>